Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for making it to round four out of four. So today, this is my last lecture. So today we'll talk about um, two different aspects. Um, hopefully I'll have time to cover both. One is uh, issues about flows created by cells and swimming cells, asking questions about how to think about the flows that they create, how to model it, and how does it compare with experiments. And then I've chosen, because I couldn't talk about everything that has to do with flow, I've chosen one topic, which is interaction with surfaces, and we'll see a few different topics. Hopefully I'll have time to cover everything about how the flows impact how the cells, uh, how the flows govern uh, to some extent how the cells interact with uh, surfaces. So the first, first picture is a picture I've shown already a few times. Uh, this is, okay, trying to go backwards. This is not working, yes it works. Uh, remind you, these are the type of organisms that we discussed so far. So today I'm gonna to ask a question, a kind of a generic question to begin with, which is uh, all of those organisms create flow, they perturb the fluid around them because they're moving relative to the fluid that doesn't move. So they create a flow around them. How do you think about the flows? Uh, how to model the flows that are created by the cells? Of course, there's a big range of length scales, but if we look away from the cell, and length scales are much larger than their individual uh, 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 scales, then actually the flows we'll, we'll see are very generic. We can describe this in a very generic fashion. So I'll remind you that we talked, uh, I think it was the first lecture, we talked about the flow that is created, the fundamental flow in a, in, a, in a viscous fluid due to a force. So if I put a force at a particular point, X prime, a uh, localized force, then um, if I look on length scales much, much further away from the kind of the amount that the length scale that, that characterizes where I'm uh, distributing this force, I'm gonna get a flow which decays like one over R. This is my famous Stokes let. This is the flow due to a point force. So this flow, this is a tensor we already talked about. It has this famous anisotropic response, but the important thing is that this decays like one over R. So the flow, if I apply a force, I get a very long range flow decaying like one over R. Now cells cannot apply a force. They're force free and they're also torque free. And as a result, uh, their flows, the flows that they create, generically cannot contain a Stokes let. So if I, measure, if I measure a flow, it cannot have a one over R because this one over R would be a signature of a force applied to the fluid. So that means that I have to kill, in everything I do, we'll have to kill the Stokes let components. So that means that the flows we will understand generically can only uh, behave as one extra power, a gradient of one over R. So the flows will always, in general, decay like one over R squared. And the reason for this, so you don't have a net force, but you have a first moment of a force, and you have force dipoles, something that is very generic. So here I illustrate this on uh, pictures. These are uh, drawings that my dad did. This is meant to represent a sperm cell. This is meant to represent a bacterium. Here's an algae. And uh, you have dipoles. So let's look at, for example, a bacterium. You have dipoles because you remember we talked about the fact that the cell is creating propulsion, so around its propelling uh, apparatus, the flagellar filament, it's pushing fluid away from the cell, and the cell swims, so this means that the rest of the body moves, and so the rest of the body also pushes fluid in this direction, so there's a bit of pushing in the back, there's a bit of pushing in the front in the opposite direction. Of course, the magnitude of that arrow, the white and the black arrows have to be the same, so that the amount of total force is exactly zero, but there's a first moment, because the center of thrust, which is around the flagellar filament, and the center of drag, which is further in the front, are separated to get a dipole. Okay, so it's a very generic reason why you get a dipole. Same thing for a sperm cell. In the algae, it's a little bit different. You have two flagella, so the propelling forces, you know, you can think of them as being one half on one side, one half on the other. Well, the big difference is that the sign of the arrows, suppose you were to just join those two white arrows into a big one right here, uh, the relative sign have been flipped. See, those two arrows are pointing away from one another, and that one is going the other way. So actually what we'll see is that the flows created by this are kind of the instantaneously reversal of flows created by algae. So this is meant to kind of justify uh, uh, intuitively why you have dipoles. So how do we do dipoles? Well, it's kind of rather straightforward to do calculation for dipoles. Suppose I have a, a force uh, of magnitude minus f in the e direction, and I put another one at a distance epsilon L, L is a length scale, epsilon is a small number uh, along a vector D, and that force here is plus Fe, right? So the total force is zero, but I have a separation. And if you take epsilon to zero, so you get the kind of the gradient, well, the flow you know is 
st one stokes let minus another stokes let. And if you take in the limit when epsilon goes to zero, so that those two forces come closer and closer and closer, it's a Taylor expansion. So you'll get a gradient of that uh, Osin tensor. Uh, and uh, if you denote, if you call this epsilon times length times force a dipole strength, so it has magnitude, it has units or dimensions of a length times a force, then that dipole uh, is given by ta simply taking a gradient of the Osin flow along a particular direction. And that Osin flow, I've, I've uh, re redefined it here so that a vector is the force magnitude times a vector, so g is a vector, so the gradient of g is a tensor. And it depends on, obviously, R. It depends on E. Uh, and so this is the gradient of this along a particular E direction. Uh, and I have to dot this with D, because that's the direction along which I'm taking the gradient. And in the end, you get this very nice formula. The dipole flow is a flow that which decays like 1 over R squared. So this is R over R cubed. That's 1 over R squared. Same thing here. This one is R cubed over R to the 5. So all of those three terms decay like 1 over distance squared. Uh, and it depends on, well, obviously, how far you are, the, the relative position relative to where the dipole is, but also those two vectors, E and D. E, remind you, is the direction of the force, and D is the direction of the dipole. But e yes? Well, what you need to do, you know, for this term, for, one way to rephrase your question is, when is this term much more than that term? So basically, what you need is you need a length scale. There's a length scale here, an intrinsic length scale, which is how far you are from those singularities. That has to be much, much larger than the other length scale, the only other length scale in my problem, which is the distance, this epsilon L distance between the two singularities. Yeah. But D and E should be parallel, otherwise you inject the fork in the thing. So I'm talk about this in a minute, yes. Let's not go too fast, please. I have decided to go at uh, this speed. Um, so uh, give me, please give me one minute to just get to. Yes. No, no, it's, it's a good question. Of course, it's a good question. I will answer this in about 35 seconds. OK, so you can, uh, this dipole depends on E and D. And <clears throat> if you flip E and D, those last two terms remain the same, but this one becomes minus itself. And so therefore, I'm going to define a symmetric part uh, which is basically the dipole with E and D, a half of the dipole plus the one where D and D are, are flipped, and then the anti-symmetric. So this first bit is the anti-symmetric, and the second part, and this uh, purple one is the symmetric part. Now, the anti-symmetric part, the uh, interpretation of this is exactly what you just pointed out, which is the torque. Clearly, if I look at this picture, it looks like unless I'm doing this correctly, then I'm going to create a torque. Now, you said the E and the D have to be parallel. Yes and no. If I only have one E and one D, they have to be parallel. But I could take two of those. One creates a torque one way, one creates a torque the other way. And so the combination of those two could create exactly zero torque. That's another way to do it. It's called a stresslet. I'll talk about this in a minute. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are, have not done a lot of Stokes flow hydrodynamics, first of all, you're missing out because Stokes flow hydrodynamics is really nice. And I'm going to give you just a minute. So what the, the physical interpretation of this flow so look at this flow is a constant times a vector cross r over r cubed. Turns out that's an exact solution of a very classical solution in Stokes flow. It's related to Stokes flow due to a rotating sphere. So if I take a sphere of radius a and I rigidly rotate it in an infinite viscous fluid, the flow is very simple. This is the flow. So it verifies Stokes equation, it verifies all the boundary conditions. That's the answer. And the viscous torque exerted on the fluid is proportional to the rotation rate, and it scales with the cube of the size, which means that uh, you, got a, you had a cube here, and that's the same cube here, which means that you can actually rewrite. This is a very nice interpretation of this flow. You can rewrite this flow as the torque, the local torque that the sphere is exerting on the fluid cross R over R cube with 1 over 8 pi mu. So it's exactly the same formula. And you interpret the torque at exactly the dipole strength times the cross product between D and E. Physically, we can see it's, if they're not aligned, then they apply a moment arm. And the magnitude is exactly to within the cross product is exactly the dipole strength. So the swimming cells not only are force free, so, but they're also torque free. And so that, that anti-symmetric component is not allowed, OK? Unless the cells have other things they do. There are some cells that have torque. There are some cells that have uh, distribution of mass inside their body, which is uh, and not uniformly distributed, but asymmetric. And those cells, as soon as they're not aligned with gravity, they're, they're called bottom heavy. And if you tilt them away from being aligned with gravity, then they're experiencing a net torque, net gravitational torque, 
which brings them back, okay? So that can exert a torque on the fluid. But in general, I'm gonna talk about cells that are not like this, uh, which means that the flow can only be this flow, um, uh, as which is the symmetric part of this. Uh, there's a way, here I've only, considered, I've only considered one E and one D, but you can have linear superposition of those, and provided that, you, you know, as long as you ask for the flow to have no torque at all, the most general flow, that was derived by a very classical paper by George Batchelor, uh, he was interested in suspensions. He was interested in the signature, the hydraulic signature of the suspension, if you shear a suspension or any kind of flow. What is the flow that is radiated back by those uh, spheres, rigid spheres, which are uh, force-free, torque-free, but of course they exert a perturbation to the flow. So the most general flow is now called the stresslet, and it's characterized by a tensor, uh, S, which is, has to be um, trace-free, Otherwise, it's symmetric, trace-free, anything you want, uh, and it's the flow that decays like one over R squared. Uh, in this particular case, the stress that here is here. You can just read it off from this formula. Comparing this with that, you can just read it off. And the, in the very simple limit, the classical axisymmetric limit, where E and D are the same, so you're taking a gradient along the same direction as the force itself, then it's the classical uh, dipole strength times uh, a third of identity minus EE. And that is symmetric, that is trace-free, and uh, the sign of P detect whether it's, well, we'll talk in a minute about this, okay? So the flow, if you, if you are in this limit, the axisymmetric limit, this flow has this very uh, classical uh, formula uh, right here. So that's flow due to an axisymmetric force dipole. So what do those dipoles look like? Well, those dipoles have a, uh, if you go back one second to this formula, you can see that there are two things in this formula. One is the, E, which is this unit vector along the axis of the cell, and then second thing is P. And P, of course, is a number that could have a, as magnitude and have a sign. It could be positive, could be negative. So those two organisms on the left are characterized by positive P, and they're called pushers. These are cells which are creating flow, which locally, along the axis of the cell, are being pushed away, and so by mass conservation, there is flow at right angle which comes in the other direction to replenish the fluid that you're creating away. And uh, this organism is the opposite, it's a puller, uh, and that one, uh, on average, creates contraction along the axis of the cell, and so therefore is going to actually repel flow uh, at right angles. So is that true? So the, this is a, to hopefully convince you, uh, in one minute you will be totally convinced that all this math is actually correct. So this is our experiments, uh, very difficult experiments that were done by my colleague in Cambridge, uh, Ray Goldstein and his group, where they uh, used a microscope and they basically essentially waited for bacteria uh, to swim through the field of view. And when they do, then they would use PIV to get the flow and then they do it again and again and again until they get very nice statistics. Sounds very easy in, in, in theory to describe. I think he's told me that it's probably one of the hardest ones he's done. But at the end you get this wonderful, amazing uh, data. This is very, very clean data. This is, the, so this is uh, E. coli, 10 micron. Uh, and here you go, this is uh, kind of the approximate scale of the organism. It's just below 10 micron, maybe seven, eight. And there are the flow. So the flow, as, I've, as I uh, announced, the flow is directed, this is in the frame of the cell. The, the flow is directed away from the cell along the axis, and therefore it comes back down. This is this flow. Now if you write this flow in spherical coordinates, what you call uh, your polar angle theta zero along the axis of the cell, this formula, you can re rewrite this formula like this, it involves the cosine. Now the beauty about this formula is it tells you that there's a particular cosine where that flow is exactly zero, because when cosine squared is a third, uh, which gives you uh, basically four different directions, you should have exactly zero flow. So that's the theory that you predict. So you should have those two tongues of zero flow coming in, and look at this. Look at, uh, in the experiments, you get exactly those four tongues of zero flow that really, hopefully, visually at least, um, uh, visually and also actually you can quantify it. This is the difference between the theoretical prediction. Uh, you, you fit to this flow and you fit the value of P, which is on the order of um, picoNewton microns, na sorry, picoNewton nanometer, uh, and you fit and then you can measure the difference. And so as long as you're at least a length scale away from the cell body, which, you know, that's your question. Your question is how far do you have to be for the dipole to be valid? Well, obviously, if you're very, very close, it's no longer true. You need to look at the actual distribution. But as long as you're at least uh, about a length scale away, see, this is a, a circle of about the length scale uh, of the uh, a, a cell size away, then basically you get zero. It's within the node. So it's quite remarkable, the agreement with this and the very simple theory. 
Uh, here are some examples of what you can do when you zoom in. These are numerical simulations done with a former postdoc, Tevashish Das, who's now in, in Scotland, in Strathclyde. So the flow near the cell uh, the, remind you that this, the flagellar filament rotates one way, the cell body rotates the other way, and you get, in addition, those flows that are created. Here are some instantaneous streamlines. Uh, the complexity of this flow, it's far away, it's very simple, very, very clean, very nice, symmetric, steady uh, force dipole, but of course, around the organism, the three-dimensionality of the flagellar filament makes that the flow is very, can be very complicated, and these are uh, not trivial calculations to be able to do this. Uh, the, thing, the thing that's interesting also about flagellar filaments, this was work done with a former postdoc in California, is that because the object is chiral, it actually pumps fluids away. So if this, uh, if this flagellar filament was just a cylinder, then the flow associated with the cylinder would be mostly, it would only be rotating. You would not be able to break the symmetry. So the flagellar filaments include a component of the flow that is rotating. This is a flagellar filament computations uh, using slender body theory where you cut through and you see the flow that is a component of the flow that is rotating. But, it's, and, but there's also a weak component, weaker by, by an order, an order magnitude, uh, pumping flow. So you can actually measure an axial flow along uh, the helix. And of course, that axial flow uh, has a kind of interesting spatial dependence. But basically, this pumps. So you could, in fact, use this as a pump if you find a way to uh, rotate a rigid uh, helical or any kind of chiral shape in a fluid, then in general, this will create a force locally and it will pump the fluid. Uh, so this pump, this, this uh, flow is just at a small scale because at large scale we have the type of we have no, you don't pump at large scale, right? Correct, correct. Well, you don't, you don't pump. There, there is local flow associated with, okay, let me go back to this. You know, there is a pump here. You're pumping fluid relative to the cell body. You're pumping fluid away from the cell. Right, so, so that, that dipole is a speed. So if I measure the value of the flow speed at, uh, this is theta equals pi, this is theta equals zero. So let, let's look at um, uh, theta equals zero. This is minus one times ER. So, uh, so, so you, oh, sorry, so when theta equals zero, this is three minus one, so it's plus two times ER. So that actually is flow directed away, so it is pushing the fluid away. Right, but uh, these are these are the right, but it is still kind of fundamentally speaking a flow relative to the cell. It is still a flow that is directed away from the cell, which is the signature of the thrust that is exerted on the fluid, right? The reason why I have this dipole is because I push fluid in this direction, the cell body is pushing fluid in that direction and I create a dipole. So I think these are the same things. If you zoom in that thrust you know, th that thrust that is illustrated in this is the same thrust, the same local directed flow away from the cell body associated with the generation of force along the flagellar filament. And ultimately, if you integrate it out, associated with the generation of a net force locally, which is then canceled by another net force on the front. So they're, they're kind of the same one, you know, two halves of the same picture. Uh, th that's this, that's how I understand it. I hope this was, uh, this answered your question. Okay. At least partially, let's, let's hope. Okay, yes, other questions? No? Okay. So here are the examples of experiments. This, were, this paper was published uh, uh, also about the same time as Ray's experiments. Now these are experiments that were done with uh, algae cells. Those have, not only they have negative P, not only they have pull, their pullers, but also their flows are strongly time varying. So bacteria, because their flagellar filaments rotate at very high speed, on average, over at least one rotation of the flagellar filament, on the time scale relative, uh, relevant for the motion of the cell, it's basically axisymmetric, so it's very nice and clean, whereas this uh, is much lower frequency and much stronger time dependence. Uh, and so here are examples of the flow, then the variation in time. So this is what the cell looks like. This is conformation of the cell through a cycle. So see the cell is doing some sort of breaststroke motion. So this is extended, it goes through contraction, and then here is, it's curving back and it is about to go back to this conformation. And the flow is now strongly time varying. On average, it is uh, a, 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 a polar dipole, but the, the time dependence in those types of organisms is much stronger than for bacteria. Uh, so here, are just I, I thought I would show you this picture. These are so I've told you about the force dipole, the singularity, which is one over r square, and this is what the flow looks like in the simulation. So uh, in the theory, uh, this is the, the same theory as I've shown for uh, Ray's experiments. These are simulations, kind of much more intricate computational 
uh, approach to study what the flow is being created, and this is what the flow looks like, and see a very nice agreement, and you can use this to actually fit the dipole, and uh, the, um, uh, the strength of the dipole is piconewton micron, sorry, not nanometer, I said nanometer earlier, it's wrong, obviously the relevant length scale. The propulsive force from a, a, a flagellar filament, if the cell doesn't swim and just hold on to the cell and create a force on the fluid, it's on the order of piconewton, the relevant length scale of the cell is microns, so of course that's the relevant uh, dipole strength. Now, this is the dipole that is due to the fact that the cell cannot exert a force. Now, the cell can also not exert a torque. And for the same reason as if you don't have a force, you can have a force dipole. For some organisms, in particular bacteria, you cannot have a torque, but you can have a torque dipole. The flagellar filament, if you, remind, if you remember last lecture, the flagellar filament locally rotates in one direction. The cell body locally rotates in the other direction. And so they're both experiencing a local torque uh, equal and opposite in magnitude, and therefore there's a dipole of torque. Now, a flow due to a point torque, I told you earlier, uh, is a one, is the, was the anti-symmetric part of my dipole is one over distance square. So if I take a dipole of that, then it has to be one over distance cubed, so it actually decays much faster. Uh, and here are examples of uh, uh, this, the same group that done computational approach to understand the flow created by a model bacterium uh, and then compare with the theory. Uh, so that's a theory where you would cut through the bacterium and you would see rotation in one direction. And of course, if you move your plane where you look at the flow, at some point it transitions to another direction because the counter rotation. And in that case, the relevant scale is piconewton micron square for the strength of the rotlet dipole or the, or the moment dipole. Right. So this is what I wanted to say about um, the flows created by cells. So now I'm going, to I'm going to switch to give you an example of how you can incorporate flows to uh, try to model uh, ph phenomena. So here's, I, I've chosen this one. This is a classical experimental measurement from a, a, a zoologist who was in Cambridge. Uh, he was a lord, in fact, Lord Rothschild. So I have to say lord uh, uh, in Cambridge in the, uh, in the uh, 40s and 50s and 60s, and he published this very famous paper where he measured uh, the distribution of, this was uh, bull sperm, this is a uh, length scale here is 200 micron, so two glass plates, vertical glass plates, they're not, the gravity doesn't really play a role, and they measured the distribution, a steady state of where the cells are on average. And you get this now a very classical distribution where you have some sort of uniform concentration in the center, uh, and you get a very uh, strongly picked accumulation of the cells near the wall. Okay, and this is very reproducible. Uh, I've worked with Howard Berg, uh, and we've done the same thing for bacteria. Again, very reproducible. You get the same thing, even though the organisms are much, much smaller than sperm. So there's been a lot of work to try to study uh, what exactly is the concept, why exactly are those cells uh, showing this. Uh, very recently, I'm not going to talk about this in great detail, there's been a lot of work looking at the role of the near field. So basically, if you look at the cell, what exactly happens when a cell, one single cell, encounters very, very close to the, the on length scale, which are on the order of the cell body, encounters uh, the wall, how that modifies the flow. This is the example of how you modify the theory to account for the, the uh, that I showed you earlier for the dipole when you have a, a wall, and this is what the, the measurements show. Uh, beautiful experiments, this is from Ray Goldstein, beautiful experiments recently from uh, Roberto Di Leonardo uh, using uh, kind of a new method to image exactly what the cell is able to follow single cells uh, in three dimensions, including their entire orientation, so it's wonderful, they're able to resolve and try to kind of entangle what of the physics is very near field and how much of it is uh, a generic uh, far field. So what I want to do now is kind of show you how you can incorporate wall effects in the far field in a very generic way. So I have to do a little bit of uh, history of Stokes' flow, a little bit, uh, but there will be there will not be too much math. It's just going to be just a light touch. So I told you that the flow due to a point force is a Stokes lead. This is what the flow looks like. So now I would like to ask the question: Remember, a cell is a dipole, and I got a dipole by taking a Stokes lead and then putting another one. So if I knew how the Stokes lead, one Stokes lead was affected by a wall, well, I could then take another one affected by the same wall and then do the same gradients before. So really, if I understand how walls affect point force, then I can do everything else, because the rest is all taking gradients. So how do you, how do you incorporate effects of the wall uh, for, a, for a point force flow? Right? So you might have a rigid wall. The rigid wall is the boundary condition that the wall brings is that the flow, flow there's no condition on the pressure, but the flow, the three components of the flow have to be the zero on the surface. Now, um, you can solve this problem analytically by hand. 
It was done in the 70s by Blake, John Blake. And then you can interpret the solution physically. It's wonderful. You can, the math is kind of half horrible, I would say. But then when you invert the solution and you look at it, you can interpret the solution uh, very simply. Now, why is it difficult? So imagine you replace your surface, your rigid surface, by a simpler surface, which is here shown in blue, which is a free surface. So imagine you have your point force underneath, in, the, in water underneath a flat uh, interface with air. In that case, the boundary condition is not that of no slip. It's a much simpler condition. Well, I don't know if it's much simpler, but it makes your life much simpler. The condition is that the flow, there's no penetration. No flow can go through this flat surface. And it's a free surface, and so therefore your shear stress at the interface has to be zero. The a sigma dot n is the traction, and the tangential component of the traction has to be zero. And that means that if I call u parallel, the flow parallel in the plane of the interface, then you cannot have a normal uh, gradient. Otherwise, I would get shear, and I'm not able to sustain shear on the other side, so I cannot have any gradient. Now, turns out this is a symmetry boundary condition. If I had a problem, my problem is, say, at the top, imagine I create a mirror image at the bottom of a fake problem that does not exist, that is the exact mirror image, then if it's exactly symmetric, then by symmetry, this will naturally, for free, be satisfied. So that means that I have an answer to the problem near free surface, very simple. Because this boundary condition is one of mirror image, if I put a Stokeslet, all I have to do is put whatever I have on the top, just a mirror image on the other side. That satisfies by symmetry, no penetration, because I have the same amount of flow at the top and the bottom, therefore by symmetry, nothing will go through. And by symmetry, this is satisfied. So near a free surface, life is very easy, just exact images, exact mirror image of everything. Here, because the boundary condition is not just u dot n is zero and sigma, but it's u dot n is zero and u dot t is zero, you cannot do the same. So you have to, do, you have to solve this problem in Fourier transforms, solve this problem in Fourier space, and then Fourier invert. So that can be, um, well, depending on how much you love Fourier transforms, it can be a, a joy or a pain. Uh, but you can do it, and then you can interpret the solution. And says, so this is what Blake did. It's, it was an amazing paper, actually. And the image system, so you have a bunch of hydrodynamic images. This, for a free surface, the image is just the same Stokeslet mirror image. Uh, for a rigid surface, you have three images. You have a Stokeslet, which is, for a perpendicular case, mirror imaged, uh, and for a parallel case, mirror image and flipped in its sign. And then you have two other flows that have to be located at the mirror image point of the original singularity. Uh, and one is a force dipole. Uh, either this one or that one. And the other one is what we call a source dipole. So a point source is a flow uh, which is just creating mass. A point sink is the opposite. And if you put both of them together, you get what we call a source dipole. Uh, those two flows have vorticity. This one is an irrotational flow. A classical kind of, kind of fundamental solutions to stoke flows. And what's interesting to think about, I'm not going to use this, but it's something for you to know. If you have a stokes like a perpendicular to a surface, the total flow, you can ask yourself, how is the, now the total flow, the, exact, the problem is exactly equivalent to removing the surface and replacing the surface by those three singularities. Even though at the bottom, there's no flow. It's a fake problem. It's just a mathematical convenience. But the problem at the top is exactly the problem you're trying to solve. You can ask yourself, those four things together, my two stock slates, my dipole, and those, uh, those two dipoles, the flow that they create together uh, is a flow that decays like one over R cube. So the flow, the original flow was one over R, and you're bringing down near to a surface, and it screens hydrodynamic uh, flows very quickly as one over R cube. So it actually brings it up by two factors of R. If you have a stokes at which you parallel, there's still some hydrodynamic screening, um, uh, but the, um, the total flow is, a, is the stresslet, is one over R square. So this, if you were to, for example, look at correlations of things diffusing near a surface, the modes of diffusion where they're moving perpendicular will have very weak correlations compared to those modes because the flows associated with this decays much faster than these flows. This is an example. What's H, here? H, I'm sorry, I didn't say. H is the distance. H is the length between the point when the singularity is uh, the, to the surface. This is the length scale, the only new length scale which you bring, which is this point, how far it is from the surface. It's a length. And, and uh, one way, this is one minute aside, but you might find it is interesting. You can use those types of argument to understand, for example, in colloidal silence, science, not silence, sorry, the role of surfaces. You know that if I move a sphere in a fluid, I have a drag. It's uh, 6 pi mu viscosity times the radius. Well, if I now bring this sphere near to a wall, the drag will go up. Friction goes up. 
Uh, and the question is, well, how, how, how much does it go up? Well, this sphere, in the absence of a surface, exerts a force. And so if you look in a length scale, which are much, much, much larger than the radius of the sphere, it looks like a Stokeslet. So I can represent the perturbation to the flow from the sphere moving by a Stokeslet, calculate the imaging, the images, and then calculate how that feeds back into uh, the drag on the sphere. And these are classical formula. These are classical formula from the 60s. Uh, and here you go. So the perpendicular drag goes up by this amount. So this is at first order in radius A over distance H, uh, over this famous prefactor. Turns out there's no A over H square. There's an A over H cube. It's the next term. So actually, this is uh, the next term is much, much, much smaller than this one. Uh, and it also goes up in a parallel case, but it goes up by less. And you will recognize this factor of 2. There's a factor of 2, 8 and 16. And it's not unrelated to the same factor of 2 that I have in my in my, um, in my uh, original Stokeslet. Okay, so this is an example of how you use images to really kind of very simply understand how walls affect, uh, for example, diffusion, because that changes the mobility of the particles, so therefore it will change its diffusion constant. Okay, so. Yes. Oh, no, 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 that not changes. What changes is if I have a particle next to it and it feels a flow which decays comp relative to my distance to, because here, the reason why it doesn't, be, it, it's not, a, you were saying it would not be a much weaker effect than the other one. No, because the length scale that are in your images are still the original length scale, which is the length scale H that measures the distance. So that length scale is still the same. What is much smaller is, if I have a particle at another length scale r away, then the effect that I'm feeling from this original particle that is moving decays much, much faster. So on the effect itself, it is still the, the same, it is still works at the same order. It still works at the same order. Okay? And really, the effect is due to the fact that I have a Stokes letter on the other side. Because that flow decays like 1 over distance square. That flow creates like 1 over distance cube. This flow creates like 1 over distance. So actually, if I'm very far away from the surface, I'm in the far field, remember, or at least I have a particle that is very, very small compared to my distance, actually what really, what really, um, uh, the pr primary thing that you're, you're, you're feeling at leading order is the Stokeslet. So you see the Stokeslet bringing you down. This is what slows you down, and this one is also doing the same thing. It slows you down. By the way, what's interesting about this interpretation is that if you look at this picture, you can see that the Stokeslet is not, has not been flipped. It goes the other way. So actually, it is easier to drag a particle near a free surface than an infinite fluid. If you were to measure the effect of the wall in this formula here, in the parallel case, this sign will be flipped. It will be flipped because the Stokeslet, the image Stokeslet, instead of being the other way, it goes with you. So actually, it makes you go even faster, faster diffusion near a free surface. Anyway. Now I need to go back to bi biophysics. So and now, because I know how to do images of Stokeslet and my cell is a dipole, I can calculate the image of a dipole. Just take a gradient. It's a spiral to the surface. It's very easy. Just take a gradient along the surface. It doesn't change the boundary condition. And I know what, I, what the images are. And of course, those images create a flow. And I can calculate, I can evaluate the magnitude of that flow at the point. And it turns out, you can show mathematically, that is always attracting. The flow is always attracting. The surface is creating a flow which is basically sucking the, um, uh, the, 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 the cell hydrodynamically towards the surface. Um, it's much easier, perhaps, to understand near a free surface. It's the same effect if you were to do this near a free surface. It will also be attracted, except in this case, the image system, remember for a free surface, I should have drawn this in blue, I'm sorry. For a free surface, the uh, image system is simply mirror image. So if you have a dipole at the top, you put the same dipole at the bottom. And you remember that the flow due to a dipole, so the flow induced by this, is going away along the axis, but is actually being going down in a perpendicular direction. And if I look at this particular perpendicular direction, everything that's on that line is being attracted. And so I'm being, all I'm doing is filling the attraction by the image on the other side. Now, by the way, this is a classical problem. In some way, it's related to a classical problem, which is this issue of uh, repulsion of polymers in, uh, in, a, in a pipe or anything that's flexible. So imagine you put flexible things like polymers or vesicles or drops, uh, and you flow them in a Poiseuille flow, then they will 
uh, be sheared and deformed by the flu. And they don't like to do this, so they respond by creating a stresslet, which is a signature of the fact that they're not exactly able to follow the flow. They're providing some resistance to the uh, amount of uh, extension that they're, ex they're experiencing. And so in general, uh, a deformable, for example, polymer or something like this in a shear flow will respond locally, will create a local uh, stresslet. And the stresslet acts to um, go against the extension. So if you have this very simple dumbbell idea and it's being extended, then it acts back the other way. So in this case, it creates a puller. And the puller is doing the opposite of a pusher. A pusher is being attracted, and therefore a puller is going to be repelled. So this is a very classical result uh, that if you have polymer solutions in Poiseuille flows or in shear flows uh, or um, you know, drops and vesicles and all sorts of uh, chemical engineering deformable squishy things, they will in general be eventually repelled. You, 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 fly, you flow them in uniform at the inlet and it eventually they will uh, go, be repelled by the wall. It's exactly the same phenomenon. Sorry? Uh, well, I guess if it's exactly parallel, it's not going to be extended, but the dumbbell is being tumbled around, yes. Um, right, so the uh, one thing that's interesting about this problem is, okay, I told you that there's, a, you know, there's an attraction. Now let's think about if I had a cell that was not totally parallel to the wall but the line, so I, can, I can play with the angle. Uh, that angle could vary, it could be anything I want. Uh, and in that case, I can calculate my attraction and my attraction has this formula. Of course, it depends on theta. Well, it turns out that if theta is, goes the other way, it becomes a repulsion. Okay, it's the same uh, reason why if you look at the flow around the stresslet, some of the flow is going away, some of the flow is coming towards. So, of course, if you tilt the cell so much that you pass that critical angle, then in that case, you would actually be repelled. And unfortunately, if you calculate the average, so if you actually imagine you have an instantaneous snapshot of a population of cells and they're all uniformly distributed in angles, so you average this out over sign, you get a zero net effect. So for this to give you a net amount of attraction, so they do, otherwise the, the amount of attraction will be exactly repelled by the, uh, compensated by the amount of repulsion, you need to somehow modify the orientation of the cells. And so that flow also does this to you. So if you have a cell in a flow, I don't have time to explain exactly the, the background of this, but uh, a, a cell will be reoriented by a flow. In this case, the flow is the flow due to the images. And the angular velocity of the cell, so E is the unit vector that tells you the swimming direction, and omega is the angular velocity, it has two components. Uh, and the first component is the vorticity component. So if I put anything in a flow that has vorticity, it will rotate uh, with a half of the vorticity. Okay, that's a kind of well-known uh, kind of kinematic result. And if the object, and that's true if the object is spherical or anything, you know, or elongated. Now, if the object is spherical, that's all you have. A sphere rotates with the half of the local vorticity. And if the object is elongated, it also rotates due to the rate of strain. So even if you have a flow that has no vorticity, but is simply like an extensional flow, then an elongated body will reorient in an extensional flow, even in the absence of vorticity, uh, with a rate that depends on the aspect ratio. So this is assuming that th this formula is exact for a, a rod, which is a, the shape of an exact prolate spheroid. And it's an exact solution. It's called Jeffrey's solution. And I, I, I refer you to uh, classical textbooks, for example, microhydrodynamics. It's very, very heavy on mathematics, but you get this uh, example very quickly in the book. So uh, if I'm a cell, to summarize, I create a flow due to my images. That flow affects me, my uh, position to a velocity, but it also affects my orientation. So I can calculate the angular velocity that is experienced by, of the cell body due to the images. Now the, um, so this is what the formula looks like. And if you look at the sign, this term plus a half of all that stuff, that's always uh, such that one plus this is always positive. So that term in bracket is always positive. So omega in terms of its sign is minus cosine theta is sine theta. Uh, and it is um, such that uh, if, the, uh, uh, if the cell is, uh, the angle is between zero and pi over two, omega becomes negative. So it brings the cell parallel to the wall. And if you go the other way, if you go above pi over 2, omega is positive, so it also brings the cell to the wall. So on some time scale, the wall reorients reorientation of the cells parallel to the surface, at least, at least within this far field type of approximation. 
And if you were to then, once you have all the cells parallel, after some time scale, then if you should just balance the advection by the wall uh, with diffusion, then you get this profile, double exponential, and you get this kind of peak, this prediction of this very peak profile. And the near field is not well captured by this. The near field, the hydrodynamics and the collision mechanics and kind of the details are also important and they allow you to go, go better. But at least the generically you get this uh, kind of almost constant in the middle and then this uh, strong peaks at the walls. Now, there's something else that happens when you have, in, in the case of bacteria, bacteria, I told you, uh, have kind of straight-ish uh, trajectories in the bulk with some wiggles, so they're kind of helical. Uh, and the axis of that helix is straight. So you have a helix with an axis, and of course there's diffusion, so that axis moves around, but basically you can see kind of straight each uh, motion. Now, uh, there's an interesting thing that happens when you take those bacteria and you confine them. There's a qualitative change in the trajectories. Their motion, which used to be along straight uh, helical lines, are now becoming circles. So these are classical experiments, 1997, where they've used the tracking uh, with their microscope to follow over uh, many cycles, a long time scale, the motion of E. coli near glass surfaces. And you can see that uh, we went from this trajectory to this very uh, nicely reproducible circular motion. Uh, these are movies, these are an experiment of uh, collaboration uh, with someone uh, when I was a PhD student where we've, uh, Willow Deluzio in a group of George Whitesides where she reproduced those experiments and you can see, we can follow individual cells and see their circular motion as they uh, swim around. So there's an interesting change of the qualitative nature of the trajectories, yes. So these are, that's a very good question. Uh, those bacteria also were smooth swimming, so there are basically different lines of bacteria, and some have been modified genetically to be, to, to be what we call smooth swimming, so they no longer do run and tumble. All they do is swim and diffuse. And of course, these are very nice to do experiments uh, because you can test theories that don't include run and tumble. So those two cases are the smooth swimming strain, and the name of that strain is, is HCB for Howardberg something with the number. So, in fact, many of the biophysics papers with E. coli use that strain because then you don't have to worry about tumbles. Well, you can study things that don't include tumbles. Yeah. About the distribution between the walls that you show the, the Yes. So, uh, so, I guess if the, if the dipole is, is constant, it's the, the land scale is independent of the viscosity? That's right. If the dipole is constant. Right. And so, my question is, is the dipole constant or does it depend on Well, that is an excellent question, and I don't know the answer to this. Um, if the dipole is constant, it's independent of the viscosity, and how does the dipole vary with viscosity? When I've asked this question, I've asked this question to two people in the past, and the answer that I've had is, uh, it's very hard to change the viscosity uh, of a fluid uh, to do E. coli. What they can do is they can, uh, of course they cannot change the chemical nature of the fluid, what they can do is they can add metacellulose, they can add things, uh, make it a suspension, and I do not know the answer of whether the, the dipole has been measured. Uh, for example, Ray, the experiments were done in water and then, or you know, a, a version of water that they use for culturing the cells, and then that's it. They haven't changed the fluid. These are, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know the answer. Yeah. So one thing that's interesting about those circles, there are many things interesting. A, the fact that they exist is pretty cool to go from straight to circles. B, if you change the nature of the surface, you change the direction of the circles. So here, I'm showing you, uh, looking down to the, on the surface, motion of E. coli near a rigid surface. This is uh, E. coli in water and glass. So looking down uh, on the surface, then the motion is always in this direction, always clockwise. Now if you look, again, you can look down on the surface, so of course you have to think of, well, looking down on the surface with air, of course you don't look down on the surface with air, you would look up, but imagine, I'm just trying to compare those two, so imagine I replace solid with air, then the motion goes the other way. Every, mem every motion remember, becomes counterclockwise. Again, this is from uh, Delano's group. You can have uh, complex surfaces that do both. So this is from a group of uh, ENS Lyon. They were actually here uh, at my lecture on, on Wednesday, where they play with the physical chemical nature of the surface by um, uh, including polymers that, that promote slip on the surface, and they show that they can get some, surf some motion being blue, one direction, and some motion being red, they give the other direction. They get a, playing with the uh, chemistry a little bit, they can get uh, populations uh, that do one or the other. Uh, people have done the same with surfactants, when they've shown that if you 
have free surfaces and you add surfactants, uh, a triton in this case, and they change the concentration, then the, uh, they have a transition from one type of trajectory to the other type of trajectory. So this is the percentage of uh, counterclockwise and it decays to zero when you increase the concentration and then the opposite for the clockwise. So how to think about this? There are kind of two ways to, uh, to think about this. One is a very simple mechanical near field approach where if you look at a, this is my E. coli swimming. And remind you that E. coli has the cell body rotating in one direction and the flagellar filament rotating in the other direction. Well, if you put a helix near a surface uh, and you rotate it, then in general, it will experience a force. Okay, imagine having a balloon putting a balloon near a surface and then rotating the balloon, well in general the balloon will want to roll, so it experiences a force. In other words, it will actually require force for you to hold on to the balloon as it rotates, otherwise it will go away. And the same thing for the cell body. The cell body rotates near a surface and experiences a force, it wants to roll away, so together you don't have a net force, but you get a moment. So the surface, only because of the presence of a surface, from a hydronic standpoint, you create a moment, and that moment will act to turn the cell and it will turn it in a clockwise fashion and that's near a rigid surface. And the signs are reversed if the surface is, um, the, if the, if the surface is a uh, free surface for this reason that I've ex explained earlier about the change of the, the monopole sign uh, for a no-slip surface versus a free surface. Now there's an, uh, another interesting way to think about this uh, in the far field and to think about, okay, how can I break symmetries? How can I have, in the flow, in the singularities that I'm generating, if I'm a swimmer, how am I able to break symmetries to get a torque which will be directed on the axis perpendicular to the surface? So the flow, let's imagine that I look at the flow from a cell. Uh, flagellar filament rotates one way, cell body rotates the other way, get flow away here, flow away there. And I look at that flow averaged over one rotation of the flagellar filament so that I get an axis symmetric flow. So the no dependence of the flow magnitude along the angle, uh, along the axis, around the axis. So what, is, what is the component of all the flow singularities that could explain this rotation? Well, I have a force dipole, but that force dipole is very nicely symmetric. That cannot explain the uh, rotation. Well, this was the only flow that decays like 1 over r squared. Then I have three types of flows to which decays like 1 over r cubed. I could have a source dipole, something that's also completely uh, axisymmetric, but that could not exp ex explain, that cannot create the torque, because if you look at the uh, cell along its axis, it's totally right-left symmetric. You could imagine I have dipole dipoles, four quadrupoles, also totally right-left symmetric, but there is one flow component in the one over R cube which is not right-left symmetric. In fact, it is exactly anti right-left, anti-symmetric. That is the flow due to the rotlet dipole, due to the fact that the back of the cell rotates one way, the front of the cell rotates the other way, and if you look at the cell along its axis, the right of that flow is the minus the mirror image of the top of that flow. So that's totally right-left, anti-symmetric. So that is the component of the flow. That is the singularity which can give rise to uh, non-zero wall-induced rotation. That flow decays like one over R cubed, so therefore when I take images, I'm gonna have to take gradients of this, which means I expect a very weak effect in the far field of one over r to the four. And indeed that's the case. So if you look at this, you replace your uh, rotlet dipole by all of its images. Uh, here are all what the images are for a solid wall. Again, this is Blake's work. A free surface is very easy, it's just mere image. Well, you can get that singularity will give you a rotation rate perpendicular to the surface, whose strength is proportional to the, that particular dipole and the sign flips if you have a free surface versus a no-slip surface, which is consistent with the C in the experiment. The experiment rotates one way for a rigid surface, rotates the other way from, for a slip surface. The last thing I want to say, I need a few more minutes, is to tell you about recent experiments a few years ago, and they've shown that um, although the, the, the uh, kind of agreed upon dynamics of cells near surfaces is that they will come near the surface, will be reoriented and then swim parallel until they eventually uh, escape away from diffusion or tumbling if they're tumbling. They found some mixed bacteria, this is a very nice PRL paper, that align not parallel to the surface, but exactly perpendicular to the surface. These are still pusher cells. Their flows, their individual flow is still that of a pusher, and yet somehow their conformation is this one. Uh, and as a result of this, they're creating those attractive flows, which uh, they create those very nice crystals. These are individual bacteria. You're, you're looking down at the surface, so you're looking along the axis, and you can see 
those very nice uh, kind of living crystals. Now the flow, and as an aside, the flow that you need to create a crystal like this is kind of a well-known flow. If I have a cell, imagine I have a cell which is oriented up. That cell is trying to swim into the wall, is not able to swim into the wall, so indeed what it, indeed, instead what it does, it creates a flow away from the wall. Uh, and the, so you have a Stokeslet flow near a wall, which we've already solved for, and associated with this uh, upward flow, by mass conservation, you need to bring flow near the surface, so you get an attraction. If I have two of those cells which are pointing up, they each create a flow that brings them together, and so they're going to cluster. And this has been studied in many contexts. Uh, these are uh, beautiful experiments uh, in the rear group of Ray Goldstein, again, uh, my colleague in Cambridge, who has a green algae volvox which swims up um, uh, towards the surface, and the surface has a glass a plate, and so you get this uh, organism that would like to continue to go up, is stuck, and as a result is creating the same flow here, just flip the image, this net flow away from the surface, and therefore there is this recirculation. And if you were to look in the plane, so if I look down at this and look at the flow in the plane, I get this flow that is attractive. Uh, recently I've done work on a, this is Alban Terry, she just uh, finished her thesis in Cambridge, where she worked uh, in collaboration with a group, uh, a group of uh, Caridal Nokiveres in McMaster in Canada, on bacteria which are aligned by a magnetic field so that they, their orientation is fixed and they come down and crash on the surface constantly, always. And there's, the field is so strong that they never deviate away from that orientation. And so in the experiments, the bacteria are coming down and down and down. And because they're all in the same configuration, they all cluster and they make those big plumes of bacteria which create those large cell, large scale uh, recirculation flows. Those are a model that we've done. You have this plume and the flow, the plume is a balance between each cell that wants to come down and the flows of all the other cells which create those flow away from the surface. And so you get some balance between the two. So anyway, this was on a side just to give you, tell you in a minute why those things make crystals. So there's an interesting question, I will finish on this then. Uh, I told you about E. coli swims parallel to the surface, makes the circles, and then suddenly there are some bacteria now, they kind of look the same, there's a cell body, there's a flagellar filament, and yet somehow it decides to swim perpendicular. So is there a way, can we understand the balance between the two, why is it the case? So it turns out it's an instability, uh, we think, and the way to think about this is to think about balancing a very simple model, a balancing of force and torque on a cell. So this is, a, this is my mathematician's view of a cell. I have a cell body, I have a flagellar filament, of a, uh, the cell body has a size R, filament has a size L, and there's a propulsive force. So when we replace the whole complexity of the flagellar filament rotating and pushing on the cell, all by saying that the cell is being pushed by some force along this axis. And the cell, is near a rigid wall and it swims parallel to the wall. So to figure out, I need to figure out two things. I need to figure out the swimming speed and I need to figure out this conformation angle configuration. Is it zero, theta equals zero, parallel to the wall, or is it perpendicular to the wall, theta equals pi over two, and what sets the transition between the two? So the first thing you do is you do a force balance. You're saying, well, the drag, this is drag parallel to the surface, that has to be balanced with propulsion, but of course the propulsion that matters is the uh, you have to project the proportion here, so I multiply f times the length with the cosine of that angle. So that's simply saying, well, if I know the conformation and I know the force, then I can tell you what the drag is, what the speed is, just by balancing drag. Well, so far, so good. Now, what sets the orientation? The orientation is a balance of torque, so I'm going to move in the frame that where the cell body doesn't swim, which means that the uh, flow at infinity and the wall are moving backwards at that speed u parallel. For simplicity, it's easier to do the calculation like this. Well, we can see that there's two pieces of physics and they give torques in two different directions. One is this body near rigid surface, there's a small amount of fluid here and a larger amount of fluid here. The boundary at the bottom is moving away and so it's going to experience a torque which will rotate the sphere. Okay, of course, it experiences a torque also on this side, but the shears are much stronger here in the small gap. So actually the net amount of the uh, surface near the cell body is this torque, which is in this green direction, wants to reorient uh, theta to, be, uh, to increase. But because it's in this, I'm now in the frame of the cells, which means that in my frame, I get a flow that comes to me. And that means that if, theta is not zero, if it's any angle other than zero, it will experience a moment. There will be a moment, simply a moment arm, due to the fact that I get a drag on this filament, uh, and, uh, and that drag will, it gives rise to a moment, unless this theta is zero, so that it's exactly aligned with the flow, and get, then I get exactly zero moment. Any deviation in a uniform flow simply gets a drag. 
Okay? And you can calculate both and calculate the order magnitude of the wall, calculate the order magnitude of the uh, torque on the flagellum. Obviously, it, this one is sine theta because if theta is zero, there's no torque and it's maximum when the angle is 90 degrees, then you get the maximum amount of uh, torque on the flagellum. So, therefore, we have this torque has to balance that torque and I have to replace u theta by the formula that I get from the drag and I get this formula. So I get a formula like this. To within three factors, I get this. So if I say green plus red is zero, this is the formula that has to set the conformation. Now that formula, what's wonderful about this is that it has always the fixed state where cosine theta equals zero. That's fixed because that is a state where I have no swimming. So if I have no swimming, I have no blue torque and I have no red torque and therefore they're equilibrated to zero, everything is zero, that's fine. That's always a fixed point. And the question is, what happens if you perturb it a little bit? Well, the solution to this equation, there's another solution. And the other solution is an exact balance between one torque and the other. And that's true if sine theta equals duff. And of course, what this means, what's critical, is that if L is small enough, that diverges, that goes above one and you will have no solution. So the key, the way we understand it is that basically for short flagellar filament, that's the only state. And then there are two states uh, and this one is in fact unstable, as soon as L goes to some um, uh, value, it becomes long enough, and when L becomes very, very large, that thing goes to zero, which means that the solution is sine is approximately zero, and that's the state when the, the cell is swimming parallel. Okay, that we think explains the transition. So, deba, so this is the very simple uh, model that I've just described, very crude, uh, and then you can do real hydramic situations, not with singularities, nothing, but actually real, um, Computation. So these are, this is Deba's work where he's done boundary elements of the cell body uh, uh, and then he's done standard body theory for the filament and he's figured out a way to couple them together. And then you get the full simulation and so it's again an instability. This is the conformation uh, as a function of the size of the flagellum. If the flagellar filament is too small, uh, theta is pi over two. That's the only stable state. And then if the filament becomes longer than a critical value, then you get a transition, and then when L becomes large, 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 you end up transitioning to zero uh, conformation. So therefore, we think it is governed by the uh, basically length of the flagellar filament from short flagellar filament. So the bacterium that I showed you that makes crystals is a very large uh, cell body. So this is the ratio between flagellar filament and cell body, uh, whereas uh, for uh, cells that are very long flagellar filaments, uh, you get a transition and then you end up. So that's kind of how we uh, explain the transition between one conformation and another. Yes? Delta, you had in the previous slides, the distance between the... So delta is, has, well, it has, it is related to, yes, the gap between the two, the lubrication type. Because it comes from this formula that uh, as soon as L is larger than delta, you should uh, a small, sorry. No. Uh, well, yeah, but this is R and R plus L. So you can go through, this is what, Oops, uh, this was my next slide, this was advertisement. Uh, oops, again, uh, yes, so basically this is the full theory where you do the correct, all the prefactors, and this was the simple physical picture between the two, yes. So all the details are here. Uh, yeah. So the next slide was my advertisement. Uh, and the advertisement was, so I, I was, as uh, Jean-Francois said at the beginning of my lectures, I recently a, wrote a book and there are things uh, that I didn't have time to cover. There are many other topics, active topics of research in that field. I didn't have time to talk about collective locomotion, about what happens to a cell in a flow and how that affects the dynamics and the motion of the cell. What happens to when you put cells in fluids which are not simple Newtonian fluids, how cells and their appendages synchronize, something Maria worked a lot on, uh, what happens when the effect of noise, everything I told you was kind of deterministic to within some diffusion constant. But there are many, many topics and a lot of people still work in this field uh, and I, at least I hope you found this interesting and, and, and relevant. And that's it. Uh, I'm very grateful. Oops, this is, sorry, too, too far. This is, uh, I'm very grateful for the invitation. And uh, it was wonderful to spend two weeks here and meet so many people. And I go back home tonight uh, full of energy and uh, new things I want to do. So thank you all very much for, for coming and for, your, your, um, for welcoming me. Yes. <laughs>